So let's talk a little bit about world building. I'm excited to hear from Aaron because this is radically different than stuff we've seen before, but you still want to keep it feeling like Ruby. Well, luckily Carrie and Eddie gave me like a lot of freedom on like how to direct the season and the look. The direction was to like make it different from Remnant. The initial beach as an example is like, <laughs> could maybe kind of be on Remnant. It's recognizably human, but it's not alien per Uncanny se. Uncanny Valley almost. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, it looks that fine off. line. It's yeah, off, exactly. it's unsettling. And giant shells and yeah. things. Yeah. It only gets crazier yeah. from I there. I think my big contribution <laughs> was the six finned starfish or whatever. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was just like, yeah. they only have five, right? Let's do six. Six hey, is yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the horse flies. The rocking, the horse, rocking flies? horse flies? Yeah. Oh, yeah, those okay. are cool. I'll take care, I'll take care of that one. On Remnant, for example, um, like so many of the kingdoms are based off of recognizable places from our world. Vale is very like European. Atlas is very like New York. The Ever After had to be really deprived of any human yeah. iconography, I guess. Yeah. Got you. Definitely yeah. seemed that way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Connor started off directing the episode and you and him worked together to like really right. get this kind of like Escher style. Mm -hmm. Let's take everything and warp it a little bit. Again, just like really transseparated from anything we've seen in Remnant. Right, yeah. Overall art direction for the season's very inspired by like, I'm very into art history, so a lot of like modernism, more contemporary pieces that aren't exactly tied to one like one culture, so it feels a little bit more foreign. It works out too, because I mean like, you know, the whole thing is they're playing a, a game. game. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough about art, but it's like, I feel like a lot of those styles involve like tile and, tile, and like tile tiles patterning. patterns. Yeah. The hand drawing its own hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, it's impossible hand. geometry. Yeah. Yeah. It fit really nicely with the Alice in Wonderland themes without being literally Alice in Wonderland. With the cat specifically, you talked about geometric shapes. Is that also inspiration for the cat's look? Yes. It's not only an environmental choice, it yeah. has bled into the characters mm -hmm. exactly. themselves. Yeah. yeah. It, it helps marry the characters to the world a little bit more, and it does kind of tie back in with maybe some grim that we've seen in the past. The very subtle checker pattern on the king tie. I'll never say it right. <laughs> the big Tai snake. Two, Tai Chi yeah. So does the cat have a unique rendering style? Like, is there something does. special? <laughs> Gary, you might have to help me with this. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I, I think that started again with us just kind of wanting like the cat to feel a little bit special and knowing that they'd be in a lot of stuff. The main thing is that in most cases, like the cat does not have exterior lines, mm -hmm. which is very different for us. I mean, like that's a big part of our anime inspired style and cartoons in general is to have an outline. And we just kind of wanted the cat to feel a little bit more connected to the world and just feel a little bit different. We'll see this throughout the course of the volume, but there's a lot of of interesting ways that they can deform. The model itself was very, and the ray were very complex. Yeah. And then on the visual side, had to implement a whole bunch of different shaders and like rendering techniques. I love the cat, but this darn cat yeah. don't work. <laughs> it, it turns out when you base your entire pipeline around the idea that every character has an outline, yeah. that when you then have just one just character one. <laughs> that doesn't have an outline. It's a little bit more of a setup. So thankfully our, yeah. our VizPost team was able to like figure that out. It definitely caused some problems, but. Yeah. The, Worth well, it. Worth it. Yeah, yeah. So narratively they're exploring new areas and then animation wise we're exploring new areas too uh, yeah i oh, mean yeah. definitely yeah okay. especially with like okay. you know the cat has this a little bit but little in their rig i mean to have a character that can be quadruped and mm. biped oh, is yeah. like a thing. I would have never yeah. thought um, about that before. So yeah, huge shout out to our modeling rigging team. It's really hard to get that like perfect. So we, you know, we, the animation team and the rigging team like did a really great job of mm -hmm. figuring out the best way to blend those together. Right. I need yeah. Team Ruby running like a pack of wolves immediately. <laughs> yeah. Know, yeah. Right. Next volume. Yeah. I am now a horse you, girl. <laughs> you, you get some really funny animations when you put uh, animation cycles meant for one thing on something with a completely different rig like that. It's <laughs> very funny. Well, there's a pretty big fight in this chapter as well. well let's, let's dive into that a little bit. Well, yeah, we really wanted to, again, get back to its kind of early Ruby sensibilities. We hadn't seen Team Ruby versus dozens and dozens of enemies yeah. in a while. And so we really wanted to include something like that that felt really fun. And again, if we're focusing on the four girls, let's see team attacks, let's mm. see all kinds of cool stuff. But smaller. Yeah, but smaller. But smaller. <laughs> yeah. Literally. And it's interesting that there was a part of us that wanted to find a way for Ruby to get involved in the fight, mm -hmm. which would have been fun, but it also feels really nice for where they're at emotionally too, right? That Ruby is separate from them. And continue to build on something Thing, you know, we'll see throughout this, which is Ruby's character feeling the burden of leadership. Yes. I mean, by know. the end of the episode, she literally has them on her shoulders. Yeah. You know what I mean? That that felt really appropriate yeah. for the rest of the volume as a visual representation of that. And I also want to give a shout out to um, Kiersey Burkhart because uh, she wrote the heck out of that episode. Mm -hmm. It's always tough to structure an entire episode around like a fight sequence mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that from a writing perspective. But she just like really, she fell in love with like the game concept of it and was able to like make up rules to a game and then also break them. And she wrote a lot of choreography into it as well and yeah. it turned out great. I really wish that we would zoom out and it was just Ruby at a chessboard just going ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs>
never a dull moment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ruby Aerofell! What? What? What the heck's an Aerofell? Thanks for watching this deeper dive into this week's episode of Ruby. If you want more, come back every Tuesday after the episode and we'll talk about it and have fun. And go watch the episodes on Crunchyroll every Saturday. Please go watch it. Bye. Thank you.